الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم brothers and sisters first of all um, i would like to thank uh, you all alhamdulillah may allah reward you all with goodness and for giving me the opportunity to share some of my knowledge and some of my thinking some of it what i said today may not be based on knowledge it may be just be opinion uh, about some of the things i said maybe about afghanistan maybe it's not clear fact like the quran is clear fact and the sunnah is clear fact some of the things maybe i said is speculation but these are my ideas anyway alhamdulillah so i'd like to thank you for coming alhamdulillah to these lectures um and the other thing i want to say is in my point of view there's no such thing as a bad question alhamdulillah there are lots of good questions here but uh some of them are really not the topics i want to deal with tonight some of the questions i really inshallah will be dealing with them in in other lectures directly um and some of the questions they're not difficult to find the answers to inshallah if you read some books of you know fatawa and some books of fiqh and so on and so forth so i'm going to try and concentrate on the questions that are relevant to what we talked about tonight and alhamdulillah there's a lot of those and i don't think we're going to get even through a little bit of them inshallah but we'll try and see what we can do um the first thing i would like to mention to the brothers and sisters alhamdulillah and uh, anyone who might be watching this on the tape in the future um is just something that uh i found sometimes happens in lectures and i'm sure it's alhamdulillah from the best of intentions uh but it is important to realize in islam that intentions are not enough to make an action correct and acceptable to allah in order for actions to be correct and acceptable to allah they have to both be with a pure intention and the action has to be according to the sunnah it has to be done in the way that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions approved of us and taught to us the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said man amala amalan laysa alayhi amruna fa huwa rad whoever does an action in a way that we have not approved of will have it rejected this shows that our actions of ibada have to be done in the manner that the way the prophet approved of sallallahu alaihi wasallam so one of the things i find happens and it needs to be mentioned is that sometimes at the end of a talk the brothers in their enthusiasm someone says takbir and everyone shouts together allahu akbar this is something that is not from the practice and the manners of uh, the companions and it is not the way to make dhikr of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to the companions when they used to go uh, on jihad or they used to be marching they used to go to the top of the hills and they used to shout out allahu akbar and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to them that you are not calling upon one who is deaf rather allah hears everything and even if there was to be an ant in the depth of the sea then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would hear that so we don't find the companions after the khutbah of the prophet we don't find any narration that they used to say allah akbar and stuff like that i'm sure it's out of enthusiasm and one wants to show one's appreciation but i would like to give an advice to my brothers and sisters wallahi if you really appreciate what i said implement in your lives the things that i have taught you that's the real way to appreciate the knowledge inshallah alhamdulillah So that's the first thing jazakallah khair. And many good questions so inshallah let's try and uh, go through some of them. Okay. The first question that I think that I will try and deal with and there were many questions on this issue is about Palestine and about suicide bombing although one brother mashallah thought I shouldn't mention it. but there were so many questions there was at least 20 of them so uh, what is my opinion on this anyway my opinion is not important i'm not qualified to give an opinion or to give a fatwa because i'm not a scholar uh, but what do the ulama say about this actually there are two opinions 
about the issue of suicide bombing. And there are two opposite opinions. Uh, and there are, yes, there are two opinions. And also, there are two opinions about uh, the use of uh, uh, or killing uh, civilians uh, or women and children and uh, civilians in a situation like Israel. Now, some ulama, they say, that because Israel is an occupied land, it is a foreign force that is occupying the land of the Muslims. Therefore, if anyone tries to settle forcefully in the land of the Muslims, then according to their opinion, all of the people who do that, they are all considered combatants, they are all considered aggressors. It is not like the condition where the Muslim is, for example, attacking another country, or defending the religion that is being attacked from another country, because that is a, 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 a different type of situation. Here these people are coming to live in that land with the purpose of expelling the Muslims. So according to this, they say that they are all treated as soldiers in fact. That's their opinion. And the other opinion is as that it doesn't change, that women and children uh, are still considered to be uh, ob uh, people that are not supposed to be attacked in warfare. So, Allahu Alam, this is the two opinions. So, there is a different uh, of opinion about that. I'll tell you why I think what I think is the correct opinion, in my opinion. Uh, the, and about suicide bombing, there's also two opinions. Uh, and really, if you look to the different reasons for the two opinions, it would be very difficult to weigh up which you think is true. One group of opinion says that suicide bombing is allowed. And they say that on the basis that uh, from some evidences they use that there were some Sahaba in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and afterwards who threw, who ran into the enemy, some of them without armor, and uh, they threw themselves to what was in reality certain death. They went with their swords, they ran to the enemies and they were killed. And they say, in reality, this is the same as committing suicide. Or, for example, they, one Sahaba climbed the walls of, of Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, was then Constantinople, and he was killed immediately, the, the poured the hot oil on him. And they said that he's put his hands to his own destruction. And one companion said, no, that's not correct. Putting your hands to your own destruction, the verse means the Prophet said that when we used to build nice houses for ourselves, then that's when the Prophet said that when Allah revealed, sorry, that you're putting your hands to your own destruction, meaning you're spending your money on the things of this world instead of spending your money in the way of Allah, that is destroying yourself. So they say this is an evidence that this type of, uh, this type of way of fighting is not prohibited. So they use that as an evidence to support, um, you know, what we call suicide bombing. The other body of uh, scholars, they say, no, the two things are different. And this is a false qiyas, this is a false analogy. And they say that because they say, when the Sahaba went to fight, he did not kill himself. He did not blow himself up or kill himself. He went to fight the enemy and the enemy killed him. There's a big difference between the two things. One is where you actually destroy yourself and the other is where the enemy kills you. There is no doubt that he knew he was going to die and his death was almost certain. But that was the death at the hands of the enemy, not at the hands of himself. That's the argument. The counter argument to that is that, well, the method of fighting warfare these days is different. This is only a matter of, you know, destroying the enemy. The person who blows himself up does not intend by that to kill himself, rather he intends to destroy the enemy. So yeah, then the argument in counter says, but still it is not a, a valid difference. and We need a proof. To tell you the truth, my, what I believe is, is the closest opinion is that suicide bombing is not allowed. That it is not the same as what the Sahaba did. And that blowing yourself up is not like attacking the enemy and the enemy killing you. And I do not see anything to justify from a sound evidence that really clearly supports such an action. 
So this is what I believe to be correct. Rather, I am afraid that sometimes the suicide bombing is an act of desperation, not even, in fact, a sound strategic way of fighting. In fact, again, if we look at the whole issue of the consequences and the way that this type of co- this conflict is being uh, conducted, and this is not to say that jihad is not sound, of course it is compulsory to fight those people who have occupied the land of the Muslims until they are removed. There's no doubt about that. It's far of the line that, uh, upon the Muslims to return the land of the Muslims to the Muslims. Any Jew is welcome to live wherever he wants in the Muslim lands. It has always been the case. Alhamdulillah. When the Spanish reconquered Spain, Jews and Muslims, in fact, the Jews had their golden age in the rulership and under the rulership of the Muslims. And when the Muslims were expelled and the Jews were expelled, the Jews went to live in the Muslim lands in Morocco and Turkey. They're quite welcome to live in the lands of the Muslims. But to occupy that land, to throw out the Muslims and to remove the Muslims from the position of rulership, this is not something that uh, we can accept as believers. But the manner of conducting the warfare is important because we don't only fight for the sake of fighting. Jihad has an objective. This is the defensive jihad. It has an objective and that objective is to remove the enemy. But it seems to me that the results that we see in front of us are that all that this type of activity does is actually, it actually seems to do the opposite. Because it makes the Israelis more entrenched, it makes them more aggressive. Every time a Muslim uh, or someone, a suicide bomber blows up, you know, something or some women or some children, and then all that happens in reality is the Israelis kill 10 times as many Palestinians. And it doesn't have any real beneficial effect except that. So I don't really, I mean, of, of course I can't volunteer what is the correct strategic way of fighting and so on and so forth. And I don't even pretend to be able to offer uh, the solution in that regard. I o- it only seems to me that it is not really achieving anything. In fact, it may even be doing the opposite of what we desire. And also, I do not believe that it is halal to do that. But of course, we do hope for our brothers that for the best for them, and that if they are following the opinion of a scholar, and it's a legitimate opinion, and they're not following their desires, they follow what they believe to be true, then inshallah, we hope that their reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But myself, I do not believe this to be sanctioned in the sharia, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows best, and He is the best knower of all things. Alhamdulillah. Okay, this is a very good question here. As you clearly emphasized at the beginning of your speech that we should make Islamic law the way we live our day-to-day life, how do we enforce this as we are governed by an unjust Western doctrine? This is a very good point. The first thing I want to say is that The injustice of the West is a relative term. Yes, they are unjust. Because the most just way of life is that which has been revealed by Allah. And also, the greatest injustice is shirk. Without a doubt. However, it is a well-known saying of the scholars and a well-known principle that they have understood from studying the book and the sunnah. That Allah, that Allah, and this is very important brothers and sisters, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will support the system that is just, even if it is disbelieving. And Allah will not support the system that is unjust, even if it is believing. Meaning, if the people are just, even if they are kuffar, Allah will support them. And if the, if the system is unjust, and the way is unjust, Allah will not support it, even if it is Muslim. 
Because the sunnah of Allah in the creation concerning this affair, meaning the affair of rulership, the affair of who, is, who has the strength from the land that Allah supports, the just. Now we have to be honest about ourselves. We have to, brothers and sisters, be honest about ourselves. We have to stop all the time pointing the finger at everyone else and everything else except ourselves. Because if we compare our countries and our nations, and indeed if we compare our own behavior, we will find that much of the time we are consistently and permanently perpetrating injustice upon ourselves. And that if you compare our countries with their countries, and our system with their system in general, no one who is honest will deny that in the West, we find generally, generally we find justice. In our lands, what do we find? Bribery, corruption and injustice. I'm sure really that's why most of us, one of the reasons anyway, why many of us still are sitting here today. That we haven't left, gone back to the countries we came from. That's why maybe we left our countries in the first place. Because you couldn't do anything or go anywhere except that you had to bribe someone. You will never feel that when you go to court you will be treated justly. But that's something that generally most of us brothers and sisters living in the West, and I say it, and this is the truth. Until now I feel that when I am in England, I will be treated justly. Of course, at the back of my mind, there is the possibility they may get fed up with us and then they'll start doing what they like. But in general, in general, that's what we find. And we have to understand, brothers and sisters, that Allah will support the just people. And until we Muslims, and this answers other questions that have been asked, until we learn to be just, brothers and sisters, most of us can't even be just to each other. We can't be just to each other. I hear stories about, mashallah, some of our brothers, the shabab, the youth. Very beautiful that they are coming back to Islam. But I hear that they are not always just in the way they treat the elders. They are not just. They do not give them the due credit that they deserve. Very quick to condemn. And the other way around, sometimes the elders, we hear, are too quick to condemn the youth. And do not appreciate their enthusiasm. How many of us, brothers and sisters, we are members or we are affiliated to some organization, to some group or to some sect? And when it comes to us criticizing another group or another sect, we will find that we will even be prepared to lie, to cheat, to invent things, to fabricate things, to continue to propagate myths and lies about other people. We are not content only to criticize someone for their errors, where there is a genuine error or what we genuinely believe to be error. No, we have to invent lies about it. We have to, uh, we have to invent things about people. We go beyond the realms of justice with each other as Muslims. We can't even be just to each other. And if sometimes in our party or our group or our sect, someone is doing something wrong, if we saw that thing being done in another group or another sect, we would be shouting from every member in every mosque, look at these people that are doing that, look at these people that are doing this, have you seen their corruption, have you seen this? But if some of our brothers and our sisters in our group are doing it, we overlook it. Is that justice? Is that justice? No. This is what we call hisbiyah, partisanship. That you do not love and hate for the sake of Allah. You do not withhold and give for the sake of Allah. But rather you do it for the sake of your group or your party or your sect or your mosque or whatever it is, or your, your country. Oh, some people say, oh those lebos, they're this and they're that. And you see what they do that. You do the same thing. And they will go, oh, look at those Turks, and look at those people, and they do this and that, and really attacking them. Why? Because they're just from a different country. But you find amongst your own community the same thing happens, but then you overlook it. What is this? This is Asabiyah. 
This is tribalism. This is what the Prophet ﷺ defined. You support your own people in wrongdoing. This is the call of Jahaliyyah. So brothers and sisters, how do we think the help of Allah will come to us? Why will Allah, why do you think Allah will give us rulership and Allah will give us and establish us upon this earth? How? How? Wallahi, we can't even be just to each other. Do you think then we'll be just to the Jew and to the Christian living under us? Are we capable of that, brothers and sisters? If we now were the people to whom Allah gave rulership of this earth, do you think that we would spread good or would we spread more corruption? The way I look at us now, brothers and sisters, the Muslims, I am not optimistic. So some people have asked in many questions, then what is the solution? How do we make Islam victorious again? How do we return the ummah to the unity and the strength that we need? How about the divisions and the sects and the groups? These are all questions that have been asked and I'm answering them all without reading them out generally. How do we do that? You know, alhamdulillah, you will find brothers and sisters that the answer to every question you have is in the Qur'an, it's in the book of Allah, and it has been explained to us by the Prophet The answer is there. In one very famous narration, the Prophet Subhanallah, look how the Prophet describes our condition now. He gave a sermon. He gave a sermon. And one companion, and when the Prophet, sorry, gave this sermon, they started, the companions started to cry. They started to cry. And one of them stood up and said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, it seems to us as if this is a farewell sermon. So advise us. So advise us. So the Prophet is now giving advice to the believers, to the Muslims. What should they do when he is gone? The Prophet ﷺ said, I advise you to hear and obey even if your Amir is an Abyssinian slave and cling to my sunnah and the sunnah of the Khulafa al rashidin and bite it with your teeth and beware of the bid'ah beware of the new things that have been brought into the religion because every bid'ah is misguidance every misguidance is going astray and every going astray is in the fire here is one piece of advice from the Prophet wasallam, which is completely in accordance with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said فَتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّكُوا Hold on all together to حَبْلِ اللَّهِ the rope of Allah وَلَا تَفَرَّكُوا and don't be divided. What is the rope of Allah? In this hadith the Prophet teaches us cling to my sunnah and the sunnah of the Khulafa al rashidin This is the understanding and the way of the rightly guided successors who are Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. May Allah curse those who curse him. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. May Allah curse those who curse him. Uthman ibn Affan Radiallahu anhu, may Allah curse those who curse him. Ali ibn Talib, radiallahu anhu, and may Allah curse those who curse him. First of all, the Khulafa al Rashidin are the four rightly guided Khulafa. And it also includes all the Sahaba, those people who are confirmed to be the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, such as Abu Huraira, the trustworthy narrator of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
their ulama such as Abda, the, their fuqaha such as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, such as Abdullah ibn Abbas, the wives of the Prophet, Ahl al-Bayt, Aisha is from Ahl al-Bayt. May Allah be pleased with her. And all of the wives of the Prophet, and the rest of the Ahl al-Bayt, they are all from the Khulafa al-Rashidin. So my brothers and sisters, we have been told by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in our religion to cling to the Prophet's sunnah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and cling to the way that people were upon before they divided. To cling to the original Islam, the true Islam, the Islam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the kitab and the sunnah. This is the Islam and we have been told to beware of the bid'ah, the new things, the new things that have come up in the religion, the new sects, the new groups, the strange aqidah, the strange deviations, the strange new ibadat that people have invented that were not practiced by the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. We have been told to leave those things and to return to the sunnah. So unity, brothers and sisters, is upon that. If only we go back to the book and the sunnah and we make the book of Allah the judge between us, then alhamdulillah, this is the only way it is the only way. There is no other way for us to be united. There is no other way for us to be victorious. There is no other way for us to be successful in this life and the next except through that. There is no other way. As Imam Malik, he said, nothing will rectify the latter part of this ummah except that which rectified the former part of this ummah. Nothing will make right the end of this ummah except that which corrected the beginning of this ummah. So the truth is, brothers and sisters, our success is only going to become when we return to the way of the Prophet in every aspect. Not only in aqidah, as some people, they say, Alhamdulillah, we have the right aqidah now. Now we are upon the aqidah of the Prophet. But they forget about manners. They forget about adab. They forget about akhlaq. They forget about suluk. They forget these things. There are precious parts and essential parts of Islam. And some people only, they know about adab and akhlaq, but they forget the aqidah. And some people only, they talk about suluq, but they forget about aqidah and adab. So, no, not until, brothers and sisters, we take all of it. And all of this is the comprehensive guidance, and we return to it comprehensively. That's what we have to do. It is the way of tarbiyah and tasfiyah. It is a long way, it is a slow way. There is no doubt, it is long and it is slow. But it is the shortest way. It is the only way. That's what we have to do, my brothers and sisters. And that is where the solution is. And if anyone studies, they will find for sure that what I'm saying, alhamdulillah, is the truth. Okay. The question, uh, I don't know if I read it out now, maybe I got completely distracted. Uh, there was a question about living in this society. We live under the laws of kufr. How are we supposed to be? And that's what I was talking about. That we find that many things in the kufar society is just. Brothers and sisters, this is very important what I'm going to say now. Very important because all of us here are living in well, I don't, Australia is not the West, but for the, for the want of a better term, we call it the West. How should we behave? What are our duties and obligations? We must understand something, my brothers and sisters, and this is from the Sharia. This is from the guidance that Allah has sent down to the Prophet ﷺ. We are living in these countries as guests, even if we were born in these countries, even if our nationality is Australian. In reality, brothers and sisters, and I am British, but you know what? I consider myself, in the sense, living in that country under an agreement between myself and the unbelievers, because I am not really British, and you are not really Australian. I am Muslim. 
and you are Muslim and our Ummah is the Ummah of Muhammad and our nation is the nation of the lands of Islam. That is the reality of our condition. If we live in the lands of the Kuffar, we do so as Muslims living in the land of the Kuffar. Our true place of dwelling should be the land of Islam. And someone asked about Hijrah. Oh yes, my brothers and sisters. Hijrah is an obligation upon us to leave the land of the unbelievers and to leave and to return to the land of Iman. But if we live here under some legitimate reason that Allah has accepted in the Sharia, and in fact the only, not the only, but anyway, the most important reason that the scholars mention, and the Perhaps one of the only real excuses, except perhaps you are a refugee or you're looking for medical treatment or you're here temporarily on business. Otherwise, the only reason the ulama mentioned that you should be in the land of the kuffar is to give da'wah. As for those people who emigrated here to get more money and have a more comfortable life, this is not what hijrah is. Hijrah is for Allah and His Messenger. Whoever made hijrah to get married, or whoever made hijrah for some money or a comfortable life, their hijrah is for what they intended. You all know that hadith. Hijrah in Islam is for Allah and His Messenger, from the lands of disbelief to the lands of Islam. That is an obligation upon us. But if we are here to study, or to do some trade, or even as refugees, or we are here to give dawah, then we live in these countries under an agreement between us and the governments and the people of these countries. Even though we did not sign a paper saying, this is my agreement, this is what we are... No, but this agreement is understood. It is an understood agreement. It is a tacit agreement. It's there, it's not written, but it's understood. And that agreement is... And it's quite an amazing agreement if you think about it. It's, very, it's a very good agreement. They say to us, you are free to live here. They might even give us money to live here. They might even give us social security. Is that what you call it? Huh? We call it that in England. It's social security, man. Oh. Huh? What? Centrelink. 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 Right. Okay. Great. Fantastic. They get sent to link, right? Okay. So anyway, amazing, right? So you can come here. Maybe they'll even give you a house. You can pray. You can build mosques. You can have schools. And you know what? You can even stand up and say, I don't like your system. I don't like democracy. I don't like your way of life. I don't like your religion, Christianity. I like Islam. You should be Muslim. They even let us try and convert them to Islam. And in fact, they've even got laws to protect us to do that. But, but, they are not going to accept that you are going to fight them. They are not going to accept that you are going to commit acts of violence against them, whether in this country or somewhere else. Brothers and sisters, I ask you to think about this. It's something I thought about. Imagine we had now a Muslim land. And in that Muslim land we had Jews and we had Christians who were living there, paying the jizya, living in the land. And we were protecting them with our armies. That's what we do. And they are free to live go to the church, practice their religion as Islam lets them do that. But we find that amongst these Jews and Christians, there are people who are going off to another land and fighting against us. And then they come back to the Muslim land, come back to their families for a bit, and then they go off and they fight against us. I want to ask you, will any one of us accept that? that? Will anyone accept that? Will we accept that as Muslims? What would we do with those people? Would we not say they have betrayed the trust? We let them live in our land. They took the jizya. Our armies protected them. And they went and fought against us. We will not accept that from them. Why do you think that they should accept that from us? Is this not betraying a trust? 
Is this not being treacherous to an agreement that you have made? They do not force you to live here. They do not build barriers and say, you've got to stay here, you cannot go. My God, they might even help you to go if you want to go. You're not forced to be here. You don't have to stay in this land. If you want to go, you can go. So brothers and sisters, that is important to understand. We are free, alhamdulillah, to give da'wah. And that is what our task must be. That is our duty. Brothers and sisters, don't concern yourself too much with whether the government of Saudi Arabia, of Egypt, of Tunisia, or any other country, whether they're kafir, whether they're this, whether they're that, and we talk about jihad, and let's all brother, and this and that, and we talk and talk and talk and talk about jihad. Yet our next door neighbor is a kafir and we never talked to them and we never gave them dawah. The people who work in our office, we never talked to them and we never gave them dawah. We never call these people to Islam. But we're so worried about what's going on everywhere, everywhere. You know the thing is? The truth is, you are liars and hypocrites. You're not really worried about what's going on. It's just an excuse for you to be lazy. That's what it is. It's so easy to talk about what's going on everywhere in the rest of the world. But the things you have to deal with, the things that Allah made an obligation upon you to deal with, why don't you do that? Why don't you give dawah? Why don't you spend your time and your money calling the people to La ilaha illallah? You know why? Because we like an easy life. We like to make lots of excuses. We like to think we're big and tough and strong and what great big strong Muslims we are. But the reality is, that's not the truth. The reality is we're running away from our true responsibilities. Wallahi, you see the people who really care about Islam, who really care about their duty as Muslims living in the land of Kafir, most of the time they're too busy to bother about the bickering of one Muslim with another. They're too busy to sit down for hours talking about whether King Fahad is a Kafir or whether this person is a Kafir or what. They don't have time for that because they're busy calling the people to Islam right here. You don't live there, you live here, brothers and sisters. So deal with the issue in front of you. That's what Allah wants you to do. Allah is not going to ask you about that. He's not going to ask you about that. He will ask you, however, about your next door neighbor. He will ask you about the people who you went to work with. He will ask you about the people you met and the people you talked with and the people you live with. He will ask you whether you told them about Islam or not. That is what Allah will question you about, brothers and sisters. That is your duty and that is your responsibility. And I have found, whether it is in England or Canada or or, or here, Most of the people are not fulfilling their duties to Allah. We are living in reality, brothers and sisters, a type of lie. A type of lie. And we are only fooling ourselves. We are not fooling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So brothers and sisters, this is your responsibility. This is what you should concentrate your efforts on. I am not saying we should not be concerned about the Muslims. Of course we are concerned about the Muslims. But what we need to be concerned about mostly, 99% of our time, is these things. This is what Allah wants from us brothers and sisters. And we help our Muslim brothers and sisters where we can, but the thing and our duty and our task is to do that. There's a good question here. Do we form brotherhood, sisterhood relationships with those Muslims who do not practice Islam? It's funny because we were talking about that in the car just today as we were driving up to the Blue Mountains. Mashallah, very beautiful. Alhamdulillah. How many steps did we walk up? <laughs> SubhanAllah. What a killer. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Is Muhammad still there? Is he still awake? Okay, inshallah. Good. Okay, so, um, what, what do you mean, what does it mean, practice Islam? Anyway, one of my lectures is going to be about prayer. And the importance of prayer, it's called, pray before you are prayed upon. So inshallah, I will cover that issue in that lecture. But, I want to say generally about this uh, question, is that yes, most certainly. Brothers and sisters, this is not a time to turn our backs on our Muslim brothers and sisters. 
This is a time where we have to do our best to bring our brothers and sisters to Islam. Because if we lived in a place where Islam was very strong and everybody was Muslim and most people were practicing Islam. If we left a brother or we left a sister because they were a Farsiq and they were bad, then you know that person would feel that he or she is all alone in the world. And they will be inclined to turn back to Islam. But today, if you turn your back on a Muslim, what is that person going to do? They will find the kuffar with their arms open. Yeah, come. Let's have a pint. Let's have a drink. That's good. Come on. Let's smoke something. Let's do something. Let's go to the movies. Let's go and find some girls. Let's, 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 let's. That's what will happen. So, unless you are really afraid for yourself, that if you mix with that person, that you will get corrupted yourself, then of course you keep away. But otherwise we have to, really the brotherhood and the sisterhood, if someone is not practicing, we have to try to bring them to Islam. And you're going to do that with kindness, with softness, with gentleness, with being good to them, with advising them, and showing them really that you are their brother and sister in Islam. That's what we need to do, inshallah, to strengthen ourselves. Alhamdulillah. Okay, brothers and sisters, I think that... Um, there's some nice questions here. There's one question here. It's a very good question about someone who wants to become a police officer. And some people say it's haram. And he really wants to do it and help the Muslim community. And is asking, is it allowed or not? Actually, this is not a simple question to answer. It is not simple to say it is haram. It is not that simple. It may seem very clear Joining the police is haram, you are implementing the laws other than the laws of Allah. On the surface, we have to admit that that's pretty much true. I have to think, how could a Muslim be a police officer or something like that? It means you're involved in something that would seem to be very haram. But in Islam, we do have a principle of maslaha and mafsada. This is necessity and need. In Islam, we have a manner of weighing up the benefits if there is sometimes an exceeding benefit in something, even though it involves something haram, that thing can become permissible. I'll give you an example. Even though democracy is not allowed in Islam, and that is not our ruling system, but there are instances in Muslim countries where they have tried to introduce some type of democracy, like Kuwait for example. If the Muslims, the good pious Muslims, do not go into parliament there, then the parliament will be full of atheists, communists, secularists, and every deviated group, and every deviated person, who will only call the people to the hellfire. And the country, as a result, will fall into more corruption. So some of the scholars, not all of them, this again, you'll find a difference of opinion. But some of the ulama said, no, you must go into parliament and you must try to influence it and influence the country in a beneficial way. Because they realize that that is something that could be achieved. So things are not always black and white. Sometimes you will find in some situations there is a gray area. I don't know enough about Australia and the Australian police force and the Muslims here in Australia, and what are the needs, and what are the requirements, and so on and so forth. I don't know enough about that to be able to really direct you. This is something you need to go with all of that information to a, a trustworthy scholar to get a fatwa from. So the, the brother who asked this question, could even be the sister, but inshallah it's a brother, uh, who asked this question should go to a trustworthy scholar inshallah to get a fatwa because I'm not capable of giving you a fatwa only to say that it's not always a black and white issue what? I think we, you know, yeah, th there's lots brothers and sisters lots of good questions some of them I've sort of already covered so if you think about what I said inshallah you, you, you will inshallah get uh, the benefit from that I've got even some That's not it. I'm not going to answer that question. Because we stick to the ones on the topic. So brothers and sisters, inshallah, I think that's about it for tonight, inshallah. You forgive me if I stop now, inshallah. Um, the, the brothers are asking, please, uh, brother, ask for donations. Um, they're saying at least one dollar each. It's not a lot. 
So the brothers, inshallah, I know they're trying to do some really good and important work. So brothers and sisters, inshallah, jazakallah khair. May Allah guide you and me and all of us closer to the truth. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.